One Belt, One Road is a, is a perfect example of something. And I didn't know this until I was told this by John Kerry. So John Kerry told me that in, I think it was 2013, he was the senior American at uh, one of these international meetings that Obama could not attend for one reason or another. And so he was the person who took the meeting with Xi Jinping. And Xi Jinping in that meeting said to John Kerry, by the way, let me tell you about something I'm thinking about. And he laid out the One Belt, One Road. And Kerry said to him, oh, that's very interesting. Why don't we do this together? And Xi Jinping says, that's a great idea. Let's do this together. And Kerry came back to Washington. And he said, before he got off the plane, the Treasury Mandarin said, cut his legs off. And there was no chance it was going to happen. So it never got to Obama's desk as kind of a strategic question. But I tell you that story because if you were reading, the, if you were reading today the characterization of One Belt, One Road, you would think this was some kind of malevolent tactic to get control of the world on the part of the Chinese, mm -hmm. which it is not. It is, it is exactly what, it's set, what, it, what they say it is, which is to, which is to uh, extend a model of development into as many countries as it wanted who desperately need it. And when I talked earlier about Chinese modernization that I, that I attended last, this last Monday, so Chinese modernization, I won't go into all the details, but there are basically are five central characteristics, characteristics of it, one of which is a peaceful world, second one of which is common prosperity, third one of which is harmony between man and nature. So the foreign minister went through this whole thing, and then there were five of us asked to comment on it. And I said, in my comments, I said, listen, those of us who have ever run anything know plans are one thing, execution is another. Execution is the whole thing. So my, piece, my advice to you, the Chinese, would be, if you're going to hold yourself out as believing in these things, I mean, who's against any of these things? Who's against world peace? Who's against harmony between man and nature? Who's against common prosperity? Nobody. 10 out of 10 people. There's nobody in this room who's going to be against any of these things. So that's not the issue. The issue is, are you actually going to do what you say you do? And if you don't, you're going to suffer the same, uh, the same negative blowback that countries like the United States get when they were seen as being hypocritical. So that's point number one. Point number two, which is extremely important and a point I want to make to all of you, which I made to the Chinese don't blue in the face very unsuccessfully, which is, when I first started spending a lot of time in China was in the, well, I was chairman of Goldman Sachs Asia in the mid-90s into 2000. At a point in time when uh, the Chinese system was just starting to open up and they were just starting to put state-owned enterprises into Western markets and Zhu Ranji was the premier, or vice premier, then premier, and he was a very unusual person and he really cared about getting this right. And I happened to be there and I was very senior so I was in exactly the right place at exactly the right time to give him advice in a way that will probably never occur again because the Chinese were so in need of the advice. But one thing that struck me about them was the Chinese leadership on almost every topic, not every topic, but almost every topic, was systematically open in the following sense. They started with the premise there's somebody in the world who knows this topic better than we do. Let's get that somebody to Beijing. Let's drain his brain, let's study what he had to say, see if it applies to us, refine it and customize for our circumstance, and then execute. And they did this time after time after time, which is why, you, why you, back in those days, you would have seen both Jiang Zemin and Zhu Ranji routinely meeting with Western CEOs, Western superb academics, Nobel Prize winners, and so forth. Western head of NGOs, they met with them routinely, one-on-one, -on -one, because they knew they were getting very high-quality information coming in from people who didn't work for them, and good information was coming back the other way. That, that's, that started to stop a few years ago. That's, that's another topic. But my point is, systematically open, except I, w I said to them, listen, one, thing, one topic you missed, which is the... English language dominates the world's communication channels. And you recognize that. But you literally don't participate in them at all. So the Chinese story, as it were, 
is told by people who are not Chinese. And guess what? They don't know the story as well. They don't tell it as well. And so it's entirely absent. And until you start to get into those channels, you're going to be at a big, big disadvantage. So when you talk about Chinese modernization, coming back to that, if you believe it, number one, you've got to deliver on it. And number two, you've got to communicate it in such a way that the, re the external world, particularly the English language world, takes it in and believes it. And right now, you're failing miserably on that count. And until that gets corrected, it's, it's never going to solve that problem. 